obviously in DG competition, our role is, is to look at the markets as they exist. Um, and what we see in terms of cloud computing is that these really are very early days. We have no specific experience of any particularly cloud-specific competition issues. The few instances of cloud cases we've run across have tended to be simplified joint, joint ventures under our merger control procedures. Most recently, in February of this year, we cleared a joint venture between um, the CDC and Bull in France. And I think what's quite notable there is as is our normal practice in a, in a phase one simplified merger, we left all of the market definitions as open as possible. But in fact, the, the market share of these two French entities wasn't changing very much, whether it was European or global. Um, so that tells us something about the, the challenges for the future. Where we do have experience, which is you know potentially relevant in terms of themes, of course, is if you think about competition interventions in, in fast-moving markets, the whole debates which are, are relevant, I think, to the, the future policy discussions um, which Kane and, and Vice President Cruz are leading. In terms of wanting to let markets develop freely, not wanting to, to pick market winners, and on the other hand, needing to be sure that um, things are developing soundly. So what I thought I could do is just to focus on one, potentially two, depending on how my time runs out, um, sets of issues where we have relevant experience from the past, and that would really be standards and interoperability issues more generally, where some of the lessons that we can draw from past and recent practice, I think, can really be quite relevant for this very, um, very busy stage in the development of the cloud. So we've heard already, and I won't speak at any length, about all the advantages of open standards. We, we know that in these industries. Let's take it for a given. Um, we also know that standards which are formal, which are freely entered into, which are the result of collaboration between industry stakeholders, can lead to some issues under Article 101, under our primary treaty article relating to cooperation between them between undertakings. We also know that it's possible, it's conceivable, it has happened that standardization processes can confer market power on companies which hold intellectual property which is essential to that standard. Now that's not something that we should in any, any sense take for granted. There's no direct relationship there. You don't have a standard necessarily market power. It's a careful analysis that we know we have to go through. We have to think about what alternative technologies were potentially available ex ante. We have to look at the relative success of any standard in the market. We have to think, for example, about actually the degree of lock-in to any standard or the types of switching costs that would be involved. But certainly it's fair to say that where a standard confers market power on the holder of any intellectual property which is declared essential to that standard, the holder of that intellectual property is in a very powerful position to steer the competitive process. Um, I'm sure for everybody in the room, these basic issues of, of risks of patent holdup, issues of risks of patent holders monetizing in a certain sense, less the inherent value of the patented invention and more the customer lock-in, the risks that licensing practices subsequently could be discriminatory in terms of fees, could be excessive in terms of fees, or simply blunt refusal to license. All of these types of issues around about standards would obviously subvert all of the benefits that we would otherwise hope to achieve, would distort competition, would impede innovation, could ultimately raise price. So open standards, standards that result from industry collaboration is certainly an area where one has to balance all of these many potential benefits against some potential risks. And when we think um, this through, what, we, what we've tried to do in the guidelines on horizontal cooperation is to craft some best practices, to craft a safe harbor for all formal, informal, industry-led standardization exercises that would put them outside the scope 
of Article 101. That doesn't mean that any standardization process that doesn't comply with all of these conditions is necessarily problematic. That would have to be looked at carefully on an individual basis. But I think there's a certain value to, to just running through quickly some of these basic rules and, and how, in our case practice recently, we've, we've run up against them. So, you know, at the most basic level in an open standard, what we want to see is open, transparent processes. We want to see participation that's as wide as possible. We want that to make sure that the best technologies are potentially brought to the table. We want that to make sure that the standardization process isn't being co-opted by any specific industrial, uh, industrial perspective. In exactly that type of context, last year we opened a very preliminary investigation into some potential standard setting activities among some of Europe's larger telecom incumbents. They called themselves E5. Um, the concern here was if really this standardization process was going to, to get traction, um, weren't there other industry players who could potentially be involved? We closed that investigation, it was unusual. Um, that the investigation in fact reached the public domain because it was very uh, in its preliminary stages, but we closed that with a press release in February, the basic message being that the transfer of the E5 standardization activities to the GSMA, to this, this broader industry board, could only be positive. Secondly, in industries such as ICT, where, where IP and standardization is, is, is clearly a big issue, um, there can be an evident benefit to rules that require ex-ante disclosure of IP during the standardization process. Um, a very simple rationale, try to avoid patent ambush type scenarios, try to avoid situations where you haven't had a genuine opportunity to look at technologies on their merits, um, because that can obviously be skewed if there's some deceptive intent or some failure to reveal potential IP reading on a standard during the discussions themselves. Now these types of patent ambush issues are exactly what we ran into in, um, in the Rambus case in, uh, in relation to, the, to, to JEDEC and the various standardization processes around about DRAMs, um, a concern there that Rambus had failed to disclose IP potentially reading on a standard during the process and had sought to reap some um, Fairly, fairly significant royalties there afterwards. Ended with an Article 9 commitment decision, so for lawyers in the room, of course, no finding of infringement, especially anybody from Rambus, um, but an important commitment from Rambus which allowed us to close our file in terms of capping royalty rates on a global basis for the future. The third critical issue that's worth mentioning, and it picks up on something Katerina says, of course, is that if a standard is going to produce any benefits, it has to be accessible. Um, so to the extent that there's any IP involved in a standard, there should be an upfront commitment to license it to anybody interested on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. FRAND for us, RAND for our sister agencies in Washington, DC, but I don't really think that meaning um, changes very much. Um, now, why is that so important? As I've said, you can't have any benefit of a standard if, if you don't have it accessible, and you certainly do have these um, various risks um, round about um, accessibility of standards uh, without it. What all of that up adds up to really is is quite a quite a clear onus on standard setting organizations, however they organize themselves to have rules which themselves are, are clear and transparent because many of these problems are in fact best treated before they occur during the standardization process. In terms of standardization and our most recent um, case practice, obviously one of the more contentious and discussed issues relates to what FRAND, what fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing terms actually means in practice, and notably in relation to injunctions. Um, this is something which we in the Commission have been relatively occupied with 
through the Google Motorola investigation and subsequently with two open formal proceedings, one in respect of Samsung, one in respect of Motorola, with one statement of objections notified to Samsung, which was at the end of last year. I think there, you know, there's, there's some degree of consensus emerging, certainly between the commission represented by DG Competition, the US DOJ and FTC, that there is a, a potential harm to competition which could well manifest itself if injunctions are sought against willing licensees. Now this leaves open a discussion about what a willing licensee actually is. Um, that's a debate which is very much ongoing and where I will be happy to take questions afterwards potentially rather than going into it um, in the detail now. But I think it shows that um, issues around standards have been recurrent in the IT sector and really we should probably expect them also to be recurrent in the future. And frankly, we, we very much welcome the fact that specifically on this issue of injunctions, whether it's at the level of the ITU, whether it's within the, um, within the frames of Etsy, there's a very live and constructive debate which is currently ongoing amongst the members of these organizations, precisely with a view to crafting clearer rules. Perhaps very briefly on interoperability, because ESAS has a, has a, has a proud history, as Tom reminded us, in, in relation to the, the Microsoft saga, and uh, you, you weren't so involved in IBM sagas, but those are really starting to seem very old. So clearly, um, formal standards, you know, these type of um, collaboratively agreed processes is not the only type of way in which interoperability can be advanced. What we know, what you know in the industry better than us, is that not all important standards are the result of this type of cooperation. We can run into de facto standards, we can run into companies with very strong positions on specific markets, and risks of that being leveraged uh, into, into, uh, into neighboring markets. And the Microsoft decision is, is clearly the, the emblematic one in, in that respect, where, as you know, the commission required Microsoft to provide interface information to its competitors in, uh, in the workgroup server market so that they could interoperate with the, with the Windows system. Now, it's a very high burden under Article 102 to, to intervene in this way and to, to, uh, to force an obligation to supply. It's a high burden, I think, for, for good reasons, because in the normal course of business, a company wouldn't expect to be told it has to contract with somebody else. In the normal course of business, a company with, with intellectual property would feel that it's the essence of the intellectual property that they have no obligation to license anyone else, and indeed, that it may be the essence of their valid patent to use it to exclude any uh, infringement of its technology. So this is an area where, you know, uh, it's only prudent to be cautious, to, to respect the fact that the, the burden to, to intervene in this area is very high. As you know, it's a, a two-fold test which has been established by the European courts through a series now of judgments, so we would have a burden to show that the intellectual property is indispensable, that it can't possibly be worked around, and secondly, that without access to that intellectual property, no effective downstream competition can be maintained. And this is clearly a high burden, which I say, um, in all uh, honesty, there, there are good reasons for that burden to be high, but the likelihood of intervention reflects the size of the burden. Maybe there are a few things to say about mergers, but you know, yeah, briefly, think, very uh, briefly on mergers, um, we're developing a practice, have been over the last two or three years, of faced with, with situations where interoperability looks to be a potential issue, faced with situations where a company has a very strong position in one market which could be leveraged into another, interoperability type commitments have been applied. We look at the Intel McAfee type decision, Cisco Tanberg, uh, 
and most recently at the end of last year in respect of trusted execution environment services, mobile security services, with the joint venture between Arm, Giesecke and Afrint and Gemalto. Um, that's the latest case in which, as a condition for clearance of a merger in phase one, interoperability conditions were applied. I think globally, what we would say from a DG competition perspective is that, especially at this time of, of movement in these markets, really these issues would be better addressed ex ante than ex post. This is very clearly a scenario where prevention would be better than cure. 